So what is it I'm trying to say? I've been trying to get some kind of baseline out there, some kind of starting point, trying to emphasize that our, our senses aren't very good. Our understanding of the world isn't very good. Science, the scientific method is wonderful. But it's extremely limited on what it can do. And the problem is, whether we've been led to it or not, we believe that we know and understand a whole lot more than we actually do. As a matter of fact, there's a strange way of putting it, but when you, when you understand how little you know, you know so much more. If you understand how little you know, you know a lot. Think about that one. And we are lucky. We are lucky. We have won the biggest lotto conceivable just by being here and having this consciousness that we can consider these things. It's not that there's something wrong, you know, that we that we can only learn so much and all this, that there's something wrong with that. What's wrong is we don't realize it. By understanding that we know a lot less than we think we know, the door is wide open to a new understanding. So, if I was to tell you that uh, the world around you is less real than you think, and if you understand that you don't know that much, you might accept that. <laughs> logical, right? Yeah, that's logical. What is going on with reality? Why are there so many mysteries in the world? Mysteries are a clue. What's the deal with all these pyramids around the world? With stones that we may, we may be able to with all of our technology and all of our machinery, with all of our different fuels and lubricants and things that we have at our disposal, we may be able to recreate it. It would be a, a huge, huge effort to build the, the pyramids in, in Giza. Yet somebody built those pyramids in Giza. And <clears throat> Supposedly, they did it without any of this technology we have. And the pyramids, that, that's like child play compared to the stone uh, vases. They, they have some stone vases and other things that we have no idea what they are, but these, these vases or vases or however you want to say it. I'm from Texas, so it's a vase. They are just very, very thin, and they are built out of the hardest stone imaginable. I think it's out of basalt, and some of them may be out of granite. But how in the world did they build these things without a lathe? And I don't even think a lathe could make those shapes. How did they carve those things out of a piece of stone? And they're so thin and fragile 
uh, well, they're made out of really hard stone, but if you were trying to carve them, I don't see any way in the world you could do that without shattering the thing. You're not going to hammer on it with a chisel, that's for sure. And we're, we're asked to believe they were built with, uh, with copper tools and stones. How it, those are mysteries. How in the world are we supposed to comprehend that? How, how can that be? You know, what about, what about things like deathbed visions that are shared with people in the room? Are all those people lying? You know, a deathbed vision is where a person that's that's close to death sees quote unquote spirits of loved ones. And sometimes other people in the room see the same thing. How could that be? Are all those people all over the world having a delusion and somehow both people have the same delusion? What about the monarch butterflies? You know, monarch butter butterflies, they migrate down, they're in Mexico during the winter, up here in the States. When we're in winter, the monarchs are down there in a certain area in Mexico, and they all huddle into this one little area and as the winter is uh, start to, to leave and the, the seasons start to change, those butterflies migrate back north. And they go up here towards Texas. Uh, uh, we see them every year. And they head on north all the way to Canada in some cases. And then they migrate back to Mexico the next season when the winter starts coming back. Now that alone for a little butterfly is amazing. How do those things know where they came from and where they're going and how to get back? And even to multiply that strangeness by a large factor is that it's not even the same butterfly that left. In other words, that butterfly leaves Mexico and <clears throat> somewhere along the line, he makes a, <clears throat> he, he uh, lays eggs or she lays eggs and those eggs turn into worms and those worms turn back into butterflies and those butterflies migrate back to Mexico. How did that generation know where its parents came from? Now, I don't know if I have all that exactly correct, but the story is something like that. that the life cycle of monarchs are, is strange. Have you ever tried to, uh, to think without talking to yourself? How do you think without verbalizing internally what you're trying to think of? We rely on language to think. And how does that work with animals? You think like a pack of wolves is somehow verbalizing in their head how they're going to uh, attack this elk that's got himself away from the herd. You think when he looks at the others and they agree that they're gonna they're gonna make this uh, this hunt happen? You th how do you, how do you think that works? Somehow, somehow these animals communicate with each other in some way, whether it be body language or whatever. Okay, well that's that's pretty cool, but think about this. How does that wolf 
know what he's supposed to do. We call it instincts. The animals have instincts. They're they're born a wolf. They know that they're a wolf. And they of course their their parents and siblings and stuff teach them things, but there is something we call instinct. And that is a category that doesn't fall into those things. Somehow, those animals have this knowledge we, that we call instinct. And that's kind of a, a mystery, right? What is instincts? So there's this guy, uh, Michael Levine. He's doing, he's got a business. And what he's wanting to do with his business is he wants to be able to regenerate limbs for soldiers that have are missing limbs or people that were born without limbs or maybe they've got a spinal injury and they're, they've got the limbs, but, you know, they don't work, so they, they need a, a spinal cord to regenerate. So he's working on these uh, regenerative solutions. And the reason why he's doing it is it, it seems obvious that our bodies can do that. And for some reason, they're not doing it. Our livers can regenerate if you cut a big chunk of uh, your liver out, it can regenerate. If a, a child loses a part of their finger, if it's not sewn up or bandaged real tight, it will regenerate up to a certain age. They'll grow that finger back. And there are animals like salamanders that <clears throat> regularly regrow limbs, they lose a leg or a tail, they grow it right back. There's, there's a worm that is really, really interesting. And I always butcher the name of this worm, so I'm not even gonna try to use it. I'm not even gonna try to say what the name of the worm is, but this worm, it, This worm uh, multiplies by tearing itself apart. It doesn't lay eggs, it, it doesn't have babies. It tears itself apart. And the part that tears off without a head, it grows a, com a completely br a new head with a brain and new nervous system. And that is pretty fascinating, but to top it off, they can teach that worm how to do things. It's a long story about how those things are trained, but they can train these worms to do things like like solve mazes and things like that. And they can teach it to be afraid of something or it's gonna get pain or how to find food. So, they train these worms, and then when the worm regenerates, when it when it it's cut into pieces, and they can cut it like twenty into twenty pieces, all these pieces will grow new brains, new heads, and all will remember how to solve the problem. How does that work? You know, <clears throat> there are thousands and thousands and thousands of this type of thing, these mysteries, these mysteries are all around us. <clears throat> what is a placebo? What, what is happening that a person can take some medicine that has no benefit and get all the benefits of the medicine that it is mimicking. And even if the person is told that it is a placebo, it will still happen. 
it's not it doesn't happen as often but you don't have to be tricked you can know that you're taking a placebo and the placebo effect still work how does the the mind fix your body it's a mystery it's a mystery I'm bringing all these things up because if you found an answer to all the mysteries in the universe and it was simple why wouldn't you believe it why would why would you decide that it's better to believe all these mysteries are unsolvable when you can answer them and it's not difficult all you have to do is believe it it's not even belief all you have to do is understand what matter is what reality is what we're doing here when you understand that reality is mental that consciousness began everything just as the bible said really you know <clears throat> The Bible said in the beginning there was the Word. We take that to mean that there was God. Okay. What is the Word? What is God? I say that is consciousness. When you start with consciousness, everything falls into place. All this quantum mechanics, all these mysteries, they're all they're all right in our face saying look 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 at this understand the world around you it is a consciousness it's just like we're in a video game and i'm not saying that that we're in this this video game of some kid that's sitting in the basement somewhere in some other universe Simulation theory doesn't have to be someone has built a computer and we're in their computer. But it, it, it's an easy way to think about it. If you, if you think about a, com a computer game, a VR game, you can get kind of a rough understanding. And I'm not saying that you know, when people think about the simulation, they think about computers that were, somebody has built a computer and has simulated us in this machine. And I don't see the simulation as a machine. I see it as consciousness. And it's the same consciousness that we have. We're all sharing this consciousness as this fractal, this mental fractal. And, you know, every cell in our body has DNA that has the blueprints to our body. Every cell knows how to build a body. Of course, that Michael Levine, he's the problem. One of the first problems he ran up with is like a cell in your hand that has the DNA for your body. It might even know that it's a hand but it doesn't know how to build the hand where to stop the hand basically it can it has the information to build it but it doesn't have the information to say okay the hand is done so leonard suxton he's a uh, professor at stanford i think uh in physics and he's got the uh holographic universe theory and just like every cell in our body has dna that knows 
how to build a person. The whole universe is like that. Every piece of the universe has the instructions for the entire rest of the universe. And to explain that theory is a whole video in itself. But the takeaway is it's fractal-like. And a fractal is a, a self-repeating, similar expression of itself. So Don Hoffman, Don Hoffman, a professor at Irvine, I think it is, uh, he's got a book called The Case Against Reality. And he, he is pursuing a mathematical description of this world that is mental. He uses Darwin's theories he uses game theory to show that if we understood reality, we couldn't survive. We would go extinct. Every organism is under a, a delusion, basically, of what it actually is. And when I say this, universe, our reality is a, a projection, a mental projection. I'm not saying that things aren't real, that things don't exist at all. I'm just saying the way they exist is not as we see them or touch them or experience them. They're <clears throat> We are in an entirely different dimension to what reality actually is. And we don't know what we are doing, how we are affecting this other dimension that we are interacting with. But the things that we are doing and moving around through this mental projection has a direct impact on the reality that is projecting us. Does that make any sense? I'm going to have to think on this for a little while and finish this up later. What I'm trying to describe, though, is something that is indescribable. There's... <clears throat> There's a, I think it's a Sufi saying, I don't know, a Hindu or something where they say that the, the language of God is silence and anything else is a poor translation. So I've got to use lots of words and lots of descriptions to be able to give you just the, the foggiest clue to to what's in my mind. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to try this video. It's awfully breezy out here. But I didn't want to leave you hanging in the lurch. I started uh, shooting the video uh, yesterday or the day before. Trying to get all this stuff ready to head to Wyoming from Texas. And uh, I hope you hear this over the wind. So... I'm going to sit here close to the camera and uh, finish up what I was trying to get at. I'm trying to tell you that reality, our world, our universe, is more like a mental projection than, than the physical stuff that we feel it to be, we think it to be, we experience it. 
We're, we are having an experience, a, a physical experience. <clears throat> the When you touch something, the negative the negative uh, charges from from the electrons on the outside of, of the atom are interacting with the negative electrons on, on the atoms of your skin and they're repelling each other and it's a force field pushing each, each other apart so it feels like you're touching something when that signal comes into your nerves and goes up to your brain your brain experiences it as feeling something, as touching. That's the same thing that happens with your eyes. Your eyes, your eyes can only see a little, a little portion. I think it's about four percent. Everything else is blurry. You get a tiny little piece of, of the picture in focus. And all this stuff in your brain, your visual cortex is huge. It pieces together a, a picture and you're experiencing it. You're experiencing that picture as a solid, a solid picture. There's no gaps in your vision, but there is, you can't see hardly anything. That's why your eyes are always darting around because if you, if you get your, your eyes perfectly still you'll, you'll actually go blind you won't be able to see anything if you do see something it'll just be a little spot you'll have like tunnel vision very small so what I'm getting at is the only experience that you have is a mental experience you think you're having a physical experience because you touch stuff you see stuff when you wake up in the morning and you open your eyes, you see the entire room. You see everything around you. But no, you don't see, that's not what you're seeing. You see a little bitty portion. You see like like 4%, I think it is. And your brain paints in the rest of the room. Says, oh, this is familiar. I know what this is. I'll paint it all up and this will be an entire scene. But that's just not what you're really seeing. So <clears throat> I keep trying to emphasize that our senses are there to trick us. They're not there to give us the truth because the truth isn't valuable to us. What we need are things that will keep us alive and that will enable us to reproduce and <clears throat> that's about it so the truth doesn't really matter uh as far as our senses go now our cognition that's different we we want to know the truth because the closer we get to the truth the more gadgets we can make the easier our life becomes we're not only surviving but we're thriving we're we don't have to go walk a mile and carry back water and put it over a fire to have a, a bath. You know, we got running hot water in our house. That That is amazing. And <clears throat> then we, we understand enough to know how, how swinging a magnet in front of a coil of wire will cause these electrons to shoot through the wire. Or they don't really do that, but that's the effect. Anyway, we the more we understand, the better our life gets. So, when we all, as a species, come to this consensus that our world is a mental projection, the type of improvements, the technology that we will gain from that it's going to be monumental. Imagine this. Most of you probably have played a video game. If you played a video game in VR where you put the headset on and 
<clears throat> you experience a different reality inside that that headset. That reality it gets pretty convincing, even even though our technology is very very rough to produce it. It it can be convincing, you know. <clears throat> You'll do, you might do things like lay your controller down on a on a table that doesn't really exist. It's just uh, pictures in the headset, or something like that, or or maybe lean against something that doesn't that doesn't exist, or. It's just, uh, it's an experience. And, uh, so imagine, imagine you're playing this uh, virtual reality game. Only this time, this is, this is like a super duper game. Instead of you on the outside of the game controlling the game with these little controllers, you know, click, 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 click. Instead of you doing it, you're giving the experience to the <clears throat> the the player in the vi in the video game. <clears throat> that that little guy in the video game is doing things that is changing the reality outside of the game, and that's that's kind of a concept where you might be able to relate to something like that easier than the way I'm been trying to say it okay well my dog's on alert here I, I gotta come back in a minute so this kind of video game that I'm explaining would be one where you turn the game on you put on the headset and <clears throat> you put your your game piece into a particular situation and then you see what the game piece can create you see what it can do with what you're the position you're putting it in and this little avatar goes to work and creates things and and is causing some kind of effect beyond what he's doing in other words the avatar is creating something that the player is gaining. Like when we play a game, our little avatar, we're, we're running him around in the game and we're, I don't know, shooting up stuff or, or whatever we're doing and we're getting enjoyment out of it. And, you know, they've even used these games to uh like like on airplane simulators they're really video games and they're causing the player to to gain function to learn something from what the video game is offering so i'm proposing that in that way what we're doing in our reality is affecting another dimension where we actually are in a, in a more of like a spiritual form. And <clears throat> we are gaining from what our physical body is doing in this reality. Does that make sense? I might think of other ways to explain it, but you know, that that should make some kind of sense. Whether you agree with it or not, that's something else. And I certainly don't want you to believe what I'm saying. I'm just saying, open your mind to possibilities and go investigate, spend some time trying to figure out what reality is and what we're doing here. It, it can't be an accident. There's, that's the silliest thing I can imagine, that everything just accidentally appeared. Uh, I can't remember who said it, but somebody that was really smart said <clears throat> for the universe to just spontaneously appear like it is, it'd be like 
a tornado going over going over a, a garbage dump and a 747 plane flies out of it you know that's it's just not going to happen <laughs> so you know that can that can branch out in a whole different uh, stream of thought there but let's leave it at that and uh, I want to talk about meditation on this next one because uh, you know when you get into that those meditative states and things they can be very very beneficial to you but also about four percent of people have an opposite uh, reaction and it can even cause people to experience some psychosis and stuff. Not me. <laughs> you might think I am, but seriously. Even considering these kind of uh, propositions where about our reality and stuff can be triggering to people. So if, if, if this doesn't set well with you, just ignore it. You know, I'm just a guy on, on a YouTube thing talking, so just blow it off if it bothers you. You know, if it doesn't bother you and if you're truly curious, start out with matter and mass and energy and find out, find out what these building blocks are, you know. We know quite a bit, but <clears throat> there there is enough knowledge out there to understand how little we actually know that's the biggest takeaway we don't know near as much as we believe we do if if you can understand that you can understand the world <laughs> all right you guys have a great day